All right, everybody. Well, uh, good afternoon, I guess it technically is. Thanks for joining us. My name is Tatiana Bolton, and I'm the Policy Director for Cybersecurity at the R Street Institute. Uh, a little about us. R Street is a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy research organization, uh, which is 10 years old today. Our mission is to engage in policy research and outreach to promote free markets and limited effective government. We're dedicated to building broad coalitions, as we've done here with our data security, data privacy work, and working with a wide array of groups who share specific policy goals. Um, this makes us uniquely capable of building support for pragmatic proposals that can earn by our bipartisan consensus. We're also um, very proud to present today our recommendations for a bipartisan federal data security and data privacy law. Our team has been working diligently for the past year to find points of consensus for some of the toughest questions in the data privacy debate. Uh, I could not be more proud to present these recommendations today, and I'm excited to see them continue to galvanize momentum around privacy legislation. Uh, over the past week, we have published uh, two of those papers, including an introduction and a one-page explainer, uh, which had previously been released. Um, the, the ones that are up on our website right now include uh, the discussion on preemption uh, and the role of the Federal Trade Commission in enforcement. Um, in the next uh, few days, you'll see the uh, discussion on private right of action also go up. With this, I'm going to pass it off to our moderator for today. Uh, Copen's wife, Keegan, is the managing director for IAPP's Washington, D.C. office. Prior to returning to IAPP, where he first joined as a Western Research Fellow, Coben served as the deputy director of privacy initiatives at BBB National Programs. So, Coben, I put it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tatiana, and thank you all for asking me to uh, moderate this discussion today. I'm really excited to be able to help you feature all the hard work that's gone into uh, these papers that you're putting out and everything. So I think this should be a great a great discussion. Um, I will, let me just quickly introduce the panelists that we have gathered here. Uh, these are all the folks who have, or some of the folks who have worked so hard um, on the work that uh, Tatiana just gave an overview of. Um, Brandon Pugh is the senior fellow and policy counsel for the cybersecurity team at R Street, so he works with Tatiana. He also serves as an international law officer in the U.S. Army Reserve and was previously the legislative counsel for the New Jersey General Assembly Minority Office. Um, Lauren Zabirik is the executive director of the Cyber Project at Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center. She comes to that role um, as a 2019 graduate of the Kennedy School's mid-career MPA program. She's also the co-founder of the online social movement, Share the Mic and Cyber, which is probably one of the cooler things that she's done. <laughs> Uh, Corey Simpson is a senior advisor of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. He is also the founder and CEO of Grayspace Strategies and is a member of the advisory board at Resolute Strategic Services. Um, so each of these experts are the expert on one of the three areas uh, that we're going to be focused on today, and uh, they can kind of lay out um, their background and recommendations that are included in these um, three papers that Tatiana mentioned. Um, I guess we can go ahead and kind of lay the foundation a little bit. Um, I'll just toss a few questions out. I don't know that I have a particular answer in mind for laying the foundation. Tatiana, if you want to take some of these, that's great. Otherwise, others who want to speak, I think we can just open it up for discussion. I think it's always most compelling when we can just have a conversation. Um, so I guess it, you kind of covered a little bit of background, but like just jumping in, what is, why is a comprehensive federal consumer privacy law needed? Why is that more important than the alternative? Why is that a good goal to try to, that you've worked for a year to accomplish? Well, for us, I think um, not only is b privacy extremely important for consumers and for organizations across the country, but for us, it really is a matter of national security. Uh, for us, we believe that uh, cybersecurity as a component of national security is critical um, to uh, to progressing sort of uh, United States goals. We see, for example, um, 
uh, we see, for example, the EU and other countries move forward on uh, on larger comprehensive data privacy uh, uh, proposals and bills and laws. Uh, we see states within uh, the US, five now to be precise, uh, pass their own comprehensive frameworks. Um, and I think we're, what we think is going to happen is that some of these sort of state level frameworks are going to continue to proliferate until we come to a place where we're at with, for example, data breach notification um, that has 50 more than 50 different state standards. And it creates confusion. Uh, it, it's bad for business. It's bad for consumers. Um, there's no one clear rule or standard. Um, and I think what we're trying to do here is sort of raise that bar, the minimum um, protections and security that uh, all of the all networks across the country and consumers have. And so what we've tried to do is look at the most uh, sort of most critical issues that are so somewhat holding back um, progress towards federal legislation and try to find reasonable points of consensus uh, between the two sides so we can actually move forward. And so I think, you know, I'll, I'll pass it over to Brandon who, um, and then the rest of you in turn, to, to talk about each of the individual pieces. And so I think, you know, preemption, I think, is, uh, is first. So Brandon, if you want to talk about preemption particularly. Sure, yeah, just as a little background of preemption, Tatiana kind of said it squarely, like there, we have five states now that have standalone state frameworks and that trend's only gonna continue. IEPP is, has a great tracker if you haven't seen it, uh, just kind of keeping track of not only state legislation, but also federal legislation. Uh, and the challenge will be is as more and more states come on board, if we don't have a federal law, that's, there's an easy solution there. But once we have a federal law, how does preemption tie in? So for instance, this is state level framework is at the floor or is at the ceiling? Uh, and kind of the reoccurring theme throughout all of our papers is we don't believe in an all or nothing approach. So it shouldn't be, do we preempt or do we not preempt? Uh, there is a middle ground and that's kind of been what we've tried to achieve in the, uh, of all three papers. Uh, but obviously there's debates on both sides of the preemption argument, whether states should have their own frameworks or whether we should displace them, which we can definitely uh, you know, go into further. Yeah, and I think that's a good, uh, preemption is a good framing of kind of talking about the, the question of, of why you might need a, a comprehensive federal law, right? Because um, you're talking about, I mean, one of the arguments that you just laid out and one of the common themes is, is talking about how um, having uniform standards uh, is, is an important thing to create cohesion and the same rights for, for all uh, consumers and um, uh, kind of interoperability and how businesses are approaching things. So that does make a lot of sense as a jumping off point there. Um, I guess, Lauren, then maybe you could do a little background on the debate around FTC enforcement that's sort of related uh, as well, because you're talking about um, what is the, who has the, who is the enforcer for uh, making sure that uh, privacy laws once in force are actually followed. Um, and at the federal level, where does that uh, rightfully fall? Right, yeah. So the FTC is the nation's consumer advocacy organization, right? And most of the bills on the table actually say, yes, we should you know, go with the FTC. There are a couple other bills that say, no, we should create an entirely new data protection agency. But essentially we decided to stay with the FTC as, you know, as its role um, you know, currently stipulates because we don't necessarily wanna take the time to you know, set up these new institutions, it takes a long time. So what we did was, was try to understand what the FTC's role should be within this whole um, you know, legislative effort. And yes, it should be the primary enforcer, um, should have rulemaking authority. And you know, we went into what, what's the type of rulemaking authority, what areas should those rules cover, um, how do we enforce or how does the FTC enforce in addition to state attorneys general, and then actually how to resource it. Because right now, notionally, the FTC could and you know, wants to make rules on data privacy under unfair and deceptive practices, but it doesn't have the resources in order to do that. And so this particular piece of work really dived into all of those four issues. Awesome. Um, and then Corey, you focused more on the private right of action debate. Could you give background on um, where, on the genesis of why that's one of the major sticking points in one of the three papers here? 
Sure. Um, and first, thank you for uh, you know allowing my uh, myself to participate in this. It's it's great to be here with you. And I will say, when it comes to a private right of action or PRA, much like what Lauren was just saying, is the it's it really comes down to a question of enforcement and whether or not we want to allow everyday Americans to participate in the enforcement regime for the new law. Um, and if the answer is yes, to what extent? Um, and it's been a really difficult question um, because enforcement for, for, for something um, as large as a national data security and privacy legislation um, has a lot of um, competing interests and equities between covered entities and consumers. And so um, I look forward to diving in a little bit more, but ultimately we explored, I think, many different aspects of that and ended up making the recommendation for a limited private right of action. Cool. Well, I'll, um, I'll ask for, I think we should hear about what those, like a, the lightning round, uh, kind of elevator pitch for what the um, recommendations that you got to are, uh, because I think it's, um, there's a lot of substance in these papers, and it'd be great to kind of hear the top level summary and then dive down into some of the details. Um, before that, though, I wondered, I, you didn't, I'd love to hear more about the process um, behind writing these papers. Um, I know you kind of gave a little bit of an overview, Tatiana, but could you dive more um, into what the, how did, how did you accomplish this? Yeah, sure. So um, everybody you see here um, on the screen, as well as Sophia Lesmus, who's a, um, a senior research associate on our team, have spent uh, a long time all working together. So, you know, we sort of notionally uh, work on a particular issue, but all of us have worked together very co collaboratively on all of the different issues. And the, the path we took was basically engaging with uh, a lot of experts on the subject and working off of what we believe are um, some foundational work, uh, foundational work from other organizations like the Brookings Institution, uh, the work IAPP has done, uh, 21st Century Privacy, Privacy for America, among others. And uh, we built off of that work um, and tried to uh, pick up where it left off, right? Um, we recognized that, you know, preemption and PRA were really two big sticking points that uh, always came up in conversation when we asked people about what do you see in a federal piece of legislation? And the question we started with was, you know, how do you get past this point? How do you, how do you go further than just saying, well, we're stuck at pre preemption and PRA. We can't get past this you know, discussion. One side wants one, one side wants the other, you know, and we, we, we don't know, there's no, there's no middle ground on that. And we sort of challenged that assumption. And we said, if you were to find middle ground, what is a way, what are, what are uh, options? And we started there with each one of these individual issues. What are the different options that you could present? And we present those in each one of our papers at the very front, uh, the different ways you could limit preemption, the different ways you could limit a private right of action. Um, different options that the FTC has, um, the different options FTC has in, in terms of enforcement and whether you do include state attorneys general or not. What does the, you know, what does it look like if you're the Californian, uh, the California Data Protection Agency? What, what happens after you are, um, after a federal law is passed? We wanted to tackle those questions. And so we met with over 130 different organizations and experts uh, to, to sort of, ask the different questions and dig into each one of these people's areas of expertise. We've met with academic institutions, industry uh, experts, organizations, both on um, uh, the consumer advocacy side and uh, industry groups. Um, so we tried to get a really uh, sort of broad understanding of the different um, the pieces. And, and the other thing that we really often asked was, what would you give up and to see this happen, right? Like what would what would be comfortable for you? What would you get behind uh, in order to see this pass? Because I think everybody recognizes that a, there is no such thing as a perfect bill that goes through Congress, right? There's always trade-offs. And honestly, the way where we find um, where we sort of the joke between us is that if we don't make anybody happy, we've done our jobs, right? Because we've found a way to uh, do a balancing act that um, 
that is, that is really hard to do. There's a lot of different um, considerations that you have to take into a, into account, um, and you know, so some of the some of the things that you'll see in terms of the uh, the role of the FTC and the amount of resources and uh, and people and, and funds that they get in our recommendation is partially a an understanding that you need that stronger FTC enforcement because of uh, of the limits that we put on the PRA in order to make that balance happen and make that that work. And so um, we took we try to take everybody's input into account. And the more people we talk to, the closer we got to work Towards the recommendations that uh, that we did, and then we sent out, you know, our, our we sent out initial drafts, got more feedback, and, and incorporated it. So it's it's been a long process, but I think you know we're we're all very proud of the the uh, recommendations and where they stand. Awesome, yeah, that's super helpful, um, and it sounds like a pretty good process actually. I think that's it'll it's and I um, well we try. <laughs> And I think the papers do speak for themselves too. It's, it's, it's obvious that a lot of work went into them. Um, okay, let's do that lightning round then, uh, get into some substance. Um, I think it's good to start with the big takeaways and then uh, dive down from there. Um, so I guess my framing for this is sort of, um, if you were on an elevator, it's not just an elevator pitch, but this is the elevator and Senator Cantwell or Senator Wicker walked in um, or someone who is uh, crafting these, this legislation um, and you wanted to tell them your takeaways um, in like a minute, maybe this is a long elevator ride bigger than the Senate uh, office. Um, uh, more than one would, floor, Governor. Yeah, more than one <laughs> floor, exactly. It's in one minute of an uh, elevator ride, not a 15 second one. Um, what are the big takeaways from, from all of this work that you've done? Um, I also will just remind uh, attendees quickly that um, we can uh, take questions um, in the chat um, or in the Q&A section. Um, so please um, submit those and I will try to intersperse them or um, we will probably leave some time at the end as well for questions. Um, so Brandon, <laughs> kick us off. <laughs> sure. So uh, no, I, I definitely uh, the, the minute is the is the challenge because you know, and I just defer people to the, the look at the full reports and we can follow up as um, you know as they wish. But at a high level, we are concerned about the trend we see with with you know, five states now having standalone walls and that likely to continue. Um, we are concerned with the lack of consistency. So our overall recommendation is that we want to have a uniform federal standard. That way, consumers, industry, in terms of national security. There is a uniform federal standard. However, we do realize there are areas that state legislatures and states should continue to act on. Um, so we identified a series of carve outs uh, to try to preserve that authority. So broadly speaking, we have areas of traditional state authority in the second categories, emerging areas and gap fillers. And in each kind of bucket, if you will, has a series of different carve outs. And then connected to that uh, is we wanna pre preserve existing federal privacy laws. Uh, we realize that many of them could be improved um, but, you know, laws like HIPAA, GLBA, other financial privacy laws, that they should stand. Uh, and then any amendments to those could be considered separately. Uh, another element of that is we do realize there's a role for state level enforcement. So we believe state attorney generals or another uh, entity designated by that state should have a role in enforcement in addition to the FTC. Uh, and lastly, we're, we're not naive to the fact that the substance of the final federal privacy law is gonna directly impact preemption. A state is, is less likely to be concerned about preemption if substantively the same protections they have now at a state level are enjoyed under a federal law. Um, so obviously that ties in. Awesome. Okay, Lauren, you wanna go next in the elevator? Or I'll, and I will just admit this is giving me flashbacks because I did once get into the member elevator and that's <laughs> very embarrassing. So um, yeah, so the thing about the, the FTC thing is, you know, on one hand, if you, you know, have this, you know, overly, you know, free reign to make any rules, that's gonna really, um, you know, upset or, or, you know, confuse businesses, right? On the other hand, you want the FTC to be well resourced and guided to to actually make those those rules based on the law and have the capacity to actually enforce them. So there's this balancing act there. So what we came up with is essentially number one to recommend that Congress grant uh, the FTC Administrative Procedure Act authority instead of what they have now, which is uh, Magnuson Moss Warranty Authority. So 
the FTC does have APA for a couple things like COPPA, for instance, but generally it's operating under MAGMOS. And so we're saying, Congress, give them APA to make it much more streamlined. Two, you know, we, we thought about the areas for rulemaking. And, you know, initially we had a whole list of things. Here's what they should make rules on, et cetera. Um, but then we realized, you know what, this has to be based on the law. Right. So the law has to be the foundation. It has to say what is allowed and what is not. But the, the point of rulemaking is to make sure that that law stays current. Right. It doesn't become obsolete. So then the areas for rulemaking should be to update what's in the law now based on new harms, new business models, new technology. And the FTC needs to demonstrate that there is harm throughout there. But Congress does have to actually you know, describe what the standard of harm is. Three, enforcement. Um, really, we want to get to compliance. We don't want this to just to be, you know, hey, collection of fines. But as part of that, we do have to give or grant the FTC authority to collect those fines based on the, rule, the law and any subsequent rules promulgated from that. And then finally, the capacity. So right now, completely under-resourced. But what we're saying is give them $500 million for, for more people. And we base this off of Joe Simon's letter to Congress back at, I think, 2018 or 2019, I can't remember the date, where he said 360 people would allow me to get to this number of cases, right, to 180 cases. We want more technologists, more privacy experts, in addition to other lawyers and other support personnel. And then we also um, advocated for additional um, uh, funding for uh, infrastructure upgrades and, and tech uh, to, to meet that capacity as well. Well, FT, I know the FTC would welcome the additional resources part for sure. Um, okay, Corey, you're the last person to take the elevator ride, but certainly not the least because uh, the private right of action issue is, a, is really complex. <laughs> well, well, we'll try to keep this short and say, hey, Senator Campbell. <laughs> It's, uh, it's, it's good to see you. Um, wanted to talk to you about your copper bill um, and, and this PRA stuff. I understand it's hard. Um, and I agree with you that um, PRA should be included in, in whatever bill ultimately comes out, but maybe it should be further limited and it should be limited um, to in a way that both protects the American consumer, the American business and ensures the continue innovation base of America. And you could specifically do that by leveraging a tiered damage system, permitting injunctive relief where certain in certain circumstances and allowing safe harbors where appropriate. And you should consider creating pathways for consumers and businesses to come together outside of the courtroom to resolve their differences by establishing a right to cure. Ah, and I see this is your floor. Good seeing you, Senator. I, I appreciate you uh, getting in full character there. That's very good. <laughs> Ori has the most experience in Congress. So as always learning from <laughs> Ori ran for Congress once. True story. True story. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, did you, did you want to follow up Tatiana? No, I would, you know, I was just going to say that like, you know, in, even in all of this, I think what you're seeing is that there's a balancing act that we've been doing between each one of these pieces. And I think, you know, um, what you don't see in the final result is the changes that we've made to um, after conversations with particular individuals, some I think on uh, listening in today uh, to this panel, um, because, you know, they made valid points. Um, you know, there was a there's someone we talked to that uh, that really felt strongly about the need for particularity uh, to be included in uh, claims that are made uh, for, you know, for privacy uh, cause, right? We, uh, you know, we talked about that extensively, looked into what that might look like. We debated internally whether or not, um, you know, we we debated whether or not that was required, right? Uh, I think someone in our number still believe that technically uh, that's required of of any claims that are made in in uh, in the court. Uh, some of us are more lawyerly than others, <laughs> um, but you know, uh, and so you know, there's a lot of those things. You know, also on the FTC piece, right? Like we went back and forth a lot on the numbers. Uh, we we talked to some some people that argued a billion dollars uh, was necessary for the FTC or even more. Uh, some people 
people, you know, you, uh, we asked, you know, what, what is the right number? And very few sort of have that exact right number. And I don't think that there's any, you know, there's anything that says any particular number is right. But I think, you know, um, you know, one of the things that I came away with was from some of those conversations was thinking about how you could uh, either sort of uh, level up uh, funding, right? Like we understand that uh, FTC or any agency can't spend, can't go from zero to 60 in, in a year. I mean, like I worked in the federal government, there's no way that you can uh, take that influx of cash and be able to turn around and immediately hire within, uh, you know, uh, within six months even, right? In, in some agencies, the, the hiring process, at CISA, the cybersecurity agency, right? It takes 385 days apparently from the time you apply to the time that you're hired on board. So, you know, we, we, we grant that. Uh, and so, you know, but there's things you can do the first year, you can upgrade technology, you can, you can start to hire some of these people, you, um, uh, you know, agencies have direct hire authority. Uh, so, you know, we, we, we talked a lot about these, there's, there's nuances uh, that we've added through all of these conversations we've had. Um, but, you know, sometimes when we took something away or took something out of PRA, we added something back to preemption, right? To, to, we kept sort of titrating the, you know, the, um, uh, the recommendations so that they would, uh, they would balance each other out and we would sound sort of reasonable when we uh, came across with the, with the recommendations we made. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think it's interesting, the, the play between these, these sticking points, the fact that there is, um, uh, I think that shows some path to consensus, given that um, you can kind of, in tweaking preemption, it actually, um, could have an impact on how you limit, create a limited uh, but effective private right of action. So um, that's uh, kind of, I guess, a, f a further, it's worth reading the full papers, I guess, to see the, the, how that all works in practice. But um, I guess I can do some follow-up questions on some of the things that struck me from the uh, lightning round there. Um, I And maybe we can sort of turn it into a, a, a rolling discussion. We have maybe 15 minutes or so that we can um, get into more of the substance and, and think through um, some of the details here. So um, I'll start with Brandon again, but I, we don't need to keep going in the same order. Um, just uh, you, so you talked about with preemption, obviously um, we were talking about federal law um, coming in over the top of state law, which means getting rid of some state requirements. Um, what does, you talked about carve-outs, right? So you identified a couple different kinds of carve-outs. Could you dive a little deeper? What is a carve-out? Um, what are, exactly does it mean when you're talking about the, the ones that you recommended? Um, why, what, what are those things um, that, uh, that you're recommending and in, in, in tailoring a, a, a preemptive law to be, um, to not be overly preemptive. Sure, yeah, so essentially a carve out is, is a way we've been describing them. There's other ways you can, you can describe them, but if you have a preemptive law, on one extreme you could say that this is 100% the federal law is, is the law of the land. States, you cannot act. Uh, that is one extreme. The other extreme is you could continue to have states, have state level laws, but there'd be some baseline minimum so what we're trying to do is find that middle ground is we want the uniform standard, but then carve out areas where states can continue to act and we're calling them carve outs. You may see them described differently in some bills like one leading bill calls them state law preservation. Uh, legislative drafters, it's, it's hard to fight the urge not to call them what we'd call them precisely in legal terms, but that kind of connects to our overall theme in the paper. We want to present these differently than like a standard academic think tank, present them in clear English and make them very straightforward. And that's the reason we kind of did these buckets. Um, but just to kind of answer your question specifically, um, like areas of traditional state authority, uh, we have a whole series of things that fall under, but just give you a couple of examples, civil rights, uh, state constitutional law, state criminal law. So these are areas where a state legislature could continue to act. And we feel that's important because we don't want to see a state have stronger civil rights laws, but then inadvertently, or perhaps, in, you know, intentionally rolled back by a federal law. We, these are areas that states should continue to act. The other area are these emerging areas and gap fillers. Primarily, there's, those are areas not covered by a federal law. Maybe there's a unique privacy issue for a single state that's not contemplated by the federal law. A good example of that is an anti-paparazzi law. Not every state has them, uh, but some do. Another one that's perhaps a little more controversial is, is biometrics. Uh, you know, obviously, we, we see state law frameworks, 
How will that be you know, interact with a federal law? Uh, so though, those are all what we refer to when we, we say carve outs. We also call the federal carve outs as well, like in terms of our existing federal law, uh, not to be turn this into a legal debate, technically it's slightly different than preemption, but we do address them in the preemption uh, article because uh, you know, how existing federal laws interplays with a new privacy law is, you know, is very relevant. And I mean, it, it, one of the things that strikes me in the preemption, well, actually throughout all of these, the FTC is, plays a role in all of these papers. And so it's interesting, um, you all have definitely uh, added to the conversation of saying like, of kind of cementing the FTC as the privacy enforcer uh, in various ways, both both because as the primary privacy enforcer for federal law, um, uh, not not empowering another data protection agency, uh, for example, um, and also just as a as the um, as a way of maybe doing additional roles that it doesn't have now. So I saw that in the preemption article, you talked one of the things you discuss is that, is that maybe the FTC or some other body could have a role in deciding in the future about tricky preemption questions. Um, could you explain how that would work or, or who else could do that if it's not the FTC? Like, how, how does that happen? Sure, so I think there's two different ways that could play out. Um, obviously, there's gonna be questions of preemption that come up. Even if statutory language is crystal clear, there's always gonna be a scenario where a state could say, well, no, we're not actually preempted. Give you an example. A, if the federal law says a state cannot have a directly conflicting law, the question is, well, what does directly conflicting mean? Even if we define that, there's always attorneys, uh, myself being one of them, that's going to that's gonna question that. So uh, in our menu of options, the, um, not in our final recommendation, but as one potential option, you could have a federal agency like the FTC kind of evaluate, realizing they're the subject matter experts, could look into these questions of preemption and either could have a decision-making authority or at the very least have advisory authority for a federal court uh, when it comes to these questions of preemption in terms of like, is this a federal pr uh, protection under the federal privacy law or is this something a state can actually do? Uh, you know, realizing they have that subject matter expertise. The, the other element of that is, it kind of connects to Lauren's piece is their role in rulemaking and definitions. Um, you know, it's personal, my personal view is that it's just impossible to find everything in the law. No matter how, you know, expansive this law is, there's always gonna be questions and, uh, that need to have an agency to kind of weigh in giving them direction, of course. Uh, that is an area perhaps that the FTC could weigh in and define um, you know, some of these open-ended terms or give some more, at the very least, advice. Um, so I think there's kind of two ways the FTC, and we kind of singled out the FTC uh, to Lauren kind of acknowledge it earlier. There are other ideas out there, perhaps it's a different entity that just we've ultimately come down uh, through our engagements on it being the FTC. Yeah, does that, um, another part, another moment that the FTC comes up in, in that paper, I, and I think this is a, one of your recommendations, is sort of um, making sure that the FTC has authority over the over all industries, right? Over That there's maybe not the gaps that we see now in uh, jurisdiction. Um, is that one of the recommendations that maybe there would be amendments that would make it so that the Federal Communications Commission, for example, doesn't have this kind of carve out um, around uh, certain types of, of privacy and that would go back to the FTC? Exactly, yeah, so we do address that actually. We have a recommendation squarely on that. It falls under one of our main ones, but it is, it is addressed. Uh, so one of our concerns, um, and we've heard it numerous times, but really by consumer groups and industry groups, to be honest, um, was if we have multiple agencies, and most people look to the FTC and FCC dynamic and how they both have a privacy element, but there's other examples of that too. Uh, we're concerned because that could create duplication, it creates confusion. You could be the same company now regulated by multiple. So our overall thought was we, we think there should be one agency regulating when it comes to data security and privacy. If there's other elements of the regulation that's separate, but specifically for privacy, uh, we do right. think there's a benefit to have you know, one agency, likely the FTC, uh, weigh in. Uh, but that would also mean perhaps having to amend other statutes, especially as it comes to like good examples of common carrier definitions and how that how that plays out. Um, so that definitely cool. definitely is one of our thoughts. Awesome. And, and and I'll just throw in there too. You know, especially when we're looking at the data security side, there are other agencies that the FTC need to be working very closely with, such as this, such as CISA, right? to you know to be able to best you know create rules and 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 enforce basically so 
definitely some overlapping areas, but um, you know, giving that primary uh, authority to the FTC on regulating. Yeah, and to follow up to Lauren's point, like kind of the one of the overall basis for this project is to avoid a patchwork. Uh, and, and there, is, there's some of it's going to be unavoidable, but there is kind of a patchwork now. Federal agencies all taking on a different element of privacy. Uh, so at least having a coordinated effort uh, is is important. Yeah, and I think that also play, uh, touches back on the consistency between states, which is obviously one of the main points of preemption. Um, I You talk some about AG enforcement, right? It sounds like one of the ways that you're talking about not disempowering states is by saying, oh, well, what we would also have attorneys general out there um, enforcing the same federal standards. Um, I think there's some, it's one of the things that was interesting uh, with some of the substance that you have there on um, those mechanisms to create consistency among AGs. Uh, could you talk about that? Yes, so we, uh, so state attorney generals are, are probably the most prominent example. We've intentionally left it a little more broad and, and kind of take into account consumer protection officials or other entities designated by the state. That way it's not the federal government directing who has to have the enforcement. Um, but we do agree, like there is a role for states to have enforcement. That, that's beneficial to give states buy-in in in terms of not feeling like they're just totally overridden by a federal law. But secondly, it's important for individuals too and consumers. There's going to be uniquely local issues that perhaps the FTC just doesn't have the resources uh, to take into account or, or isolate just to one state. So that allows the state to play in there. And, and second, connected that is just the role of, of state data protection authorities. Um, so like if you take California as one example, um, you know, our thought is they shouldn't be wiped out. They shouldn't be taking actions that are inconsistent with a new federal law, but they have a great role to play in, in educating, helping with state car outs, helping with implementation. Um, so we, we see them as more of a, a benefit rather than something that's inconsistent uh, with the federal law. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I guess we could turn a little bit to more on the on the rulemaking side, um, I think that was that's one of the main that's one of the core parts of um, the paper that Lauren's talking about. Um, I guess so. We one of the things you mentioned in your elevator pitch is that um, obviously is this big recommendation to 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 allow the FTC to use APA rulemaking procedures. Um, I think you touched on it, but why is that better? I'm assuming for one, it's faster, right, than the Magnuson Moss process. Are there any other reasons that you'd prefer there to be an APA process? So that was the primary reason, right? That we we um, referenced this Chamber of Commerce paper that showed on average it took about five years for a rule to be promulgated through MagMoss versus one year through the APA. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know, to, to give them, to give the agent or the commission rather, you know, that streamlined capability to make rules, because, you know, the thing about technology is that it is evolving pretty quickly and, and the harms that can come about and the new business models that may come about. So we don't want this law to be obsolete. And then the rules, you know, promulgated uh, from it obsolete as well. We want that to be very, uh, you know, relatively quick to be able to uh, to update that, um, and then you know on the rule or the areas for rulemaking itself, you know, this concept of guided or targeted rulemaking was like the main thing that people kept talking about on on all sides, really. And so it was like, well, how do we get to that? What does that actually mean? Do we, you know, create this, you know, solid list, or you know, we, we had someone um, who really mentioned, like, you, you can't, you know, kind of say what, what, you know, those areas for rulemaking should be without being able to actually point to a law. And so that's when we decided, you know, it should really be to just update what is actually stated within the law to make sure that that law is continually updated. So by that, you mean not like the whole law, obviously, but, but parts of, but specific to find areas of the law where, especially I'm assuming where it would be uh, things that are likely to change over time, right? I think yeah. part of the idea of empowering a, an expert agency is that, oh, 
we, we can never foresee the future as legislators. So we're going to allow the agency to come in and, um, and revise over time to come up with different things. So you mentioned in the elevator pitch harms, business models and technology. Mm -hmm. And so in that you're thinking wherever, wherever those are sort of addressed in the law, those areas are the ones that should be uh, evergreen, should be able to be revised um, yeah. as yeah. as the FTC uh, sees fit. Yeah, and there are a number of different areas that were stipulated by the different bills. You know, all we actually reviewed for this one four bills for you know two on the Republican side, two on the Democrat side, and then between them there are a, a, a number of areas. But really, it came down to things like you know, how consumers can actually access their data and, you know, what they can do with it, you know, things like dark patterns and manipulation, um, you know, to, to, you know, what businesses can actually do with the data. So, so yeah, things will change over time. And so those areas we want to give the FTC that ability to update. And, but we did say within that, that it's really hard to, understand what harm means in terms of privacy. And so we think that the law has to really try to make this attempt to uh, determine the standard for the proof of harm, because the FTC itself then has to say this, you know, really demonstrate uh, this new harm through, again, new technology, new business model, um, you know, and uh, as that comes about, and then be able to actually go through the process to make a new rule. Yeah. yeah, and that's a good segue to um, the private right of action paper, which talks a lot about harms. Um, I guess, Corey, it'd be interesting to hear your take on why that's so important, why this, this issue of defining harms and, and being able to point to cognizable harms um, is such an important part of crafting the PRA piece effectively. Sure. I mean, to cut through it all, it's because without um, a, a cognizable harm, um, you're not going to have standing to get into court. Um, and so kind of the, the background behind that, the Constitution requires that individuals have standing in order to bring a civil suit. Um, this means they have to have suffered a real and individualized harm, which is a cognizable harm. Um, in order for them to bring a, a suit that may not ultimately be successful, but just to get in the opportunity to bring a suit. Um, demonstrating that harm in uh, the context of privacy violations has proven to be um, elusive and, and a bit challenging um, because the harms are not always direct and apparent. Um, so it presents you know, a constitutional uh, you know, dilemma and the challenge is really exacerbated by the fact that traditional legal concepts are, are just difficult to apply to the digital world. Furthermore, recent Supreme Court cases, um, you know, that floating around out there, I'm sure most, most of the folks here know, but just to, to mention, Spokio, um, in, in short, um, probably oversimplifying, held that a violation of statute alone isn't enough. You still have to suffer this, you know, a, a real and individualized harm. And then they followed that up with TransUnion that said, you know, whatever Congress does um, in terms of defining harms, the court is still going to give an independent assessment of this constitutional requirement that there be an individualized um, in real harm. And so I think, you know, the best advice for Congress, you know, this is going to be a gray area. It's going to ultimately probably make its way to the court, but they need to be as specific, as substantive, as measurable as they can. Um, and then if they are, hopefully the PRA will be enforceable. Yeah, and that's I think a good <laughs> a good summary of a really complicated issue. And um, yeah, exactly. It, it's not something that you can um, 
but because Congress, because according to the court, Congress doesn't have full authority to set these, to, to lay this out, um, all we can do is is hope that there's enough evidence for each of the, whatever the defined harms might be. It sounds like you guys came to maybe five um, harms, but there's like generalized types of harm uh, that are privacy harm that uh, there's sort of consensus around. Um, and so you, it looks like you looked at a variety of different um, uh, sources, some of which have many more types of harms, but narrowed it down to those five. Um, and they kind of, uh, I th thought it was interesting that they do seem to um, overlap very uh, directly with the, um, with what the FTC has kind of already thought about uh, significantly um, when it comes to enforcing on, on data privacy issues. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the five harms, physical, financial, reputational, deception, and unwarranted intrusion, um, in addition to being um, very similar to uh, where the cases have focused from the FTC, they're also um, the ones that are captured in um, COPRA, so Senator Cantwell's bill um, in the, uh, the duty of loyalty provisions. Mm -hmm. And so there's overlap there. And I think, um, you know, there's some great academic work. Um, a lot of people have looked at this issue. And I think if we really just um, focus on these five, uh, these five harms, we would probably get, have the, the greatest chance of accomplishing what the FTC has, you know, noted and that, you know, and I'll just, I'll, entertain me here for a second, but read a quote, that the government does the most good with the fewest unintended side effects when it focuses on stopping a substantial customer injury instead of expending resources to prevent hypothetical injuries. We agree with that. And that's, you know, probably an area, or this is an area where if you want to get to a cognizable harm and enforceable statute, the best way to do that would be to, to focus on these five harms. Hmm. That's great. Um, I guess I can see that we're like 12 minutes to the end. Um, I have a couple more. I can, I'll drill my questions into a couple of categories. I think uh, for business people, uh, for companies looking to comply with a potential federal privacy law, for privacy professionals that are going to be setting their practices based on the standards that might be in this, um, one of the big question would be uh, beyond just what those standards are, sort of how the implementation process is going to look for a, a federal law. And I see that there's discussion in both the FTC paper and the PRA paper about right uh, about a right to cure and sort of mostly dismissing the idea of, of, of putting in a right to cure um, as one of your recommendations. Um, and uh, there's also discussion about Im implementation window um, and safe harbors. So you kind of also dismiss the idea of safe harbors except maybe in the area of cybersecurity. Um, so I don't know if Lauren or Corey or both of you if you'd like to, talk about that's kind of um, getting that balance right for giving companies plenty of notice, but not um, giving them like, for example, a, a, third, a right to cure that would be, um, uh, would, would give them an opportunity to uh, redress something without being able to uh, be, in, without having enforcement. Uh, it's sort of a, a do-over kind of option. Lauren, go ahead. Go? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so yes, we wanted to give organizations two years to actually start to implement. You know, at, I think at one point we were thinking one year, but it just seemed too quick, right? Because there's there's a lot of things I think that um, organizations need to put in place in order to get to you know full compliance. The other thing was on the right to cure. Um, you know, a lot of people. We, one thing that we've heard a lot is you know it would give organizations sort of a first bite at the apple, or, you know, you don't have a right to cure when you actually physically harm someone. Um, and so, you know, we, we definitely took that into account. And what we came up with instead is this concept of, um, you know, not on one hand, warning letters, right? So, you know, hey, here, hey, organization, 
you know, we, we see that, you know, we've gotten complaints about, you know, this particular practice or, or whatever, but it just, it's, it's meant to help and say, here's how you're out of compliance and here are the steps that you could take to get into compliance. Um, and then related to that are, you know, this, you know, clear guidance, clear messaging around the law to, again, help these organizations to comply. Because, you know, we, we say this throughout the papers, well, especially FTC, the whole point of this is to get to compliance and not just try to collect fines. Um, so how could we put in mechanisms to best get us to that point? And those were the things that we came up with. And, and I do, I think, first of all, I, I love the way uh, that you did this and bringing up the, the FTC um, and with a PRA, because I do think that that's important as you, and especially as Congress wades through this um, and you look at a holistic enforcement regime, you want to make sure that, and you want to be comprehensive, you want to be sure there's you know parity or at least thought to what you're putting in the FTC bucket how you're placing it in there, the guidelines that you're putting around that, um, and then um, how that's going to work with what you're gonna rely on state attorney generals, other enforcement mechanisms um, to work with, vice what you're gonna allow the everyday American consumer to do. Um, I think specifically on the, the sunrise and sunset provisions um, for, a, you know, at least, uh, I, I think the simplest way of saying how we got to, to know on either of those is, I mean, everybody, you know, sitting here today has been optimistic that Congress would pass, you know, national data security and privacy legislation for, you know, years. Um, so it takes them a while to get it done. And I think it's a little bit, um, optimistic to believe that they would revision, you know, revisit specific provisions. And, and in fact, a better way to do that would be a holistic review. Um, whenever, you know, technologies change or conditions change that, re that require them to do that. So I think that's an important piece of that. And then I think when you consider, you know, the right to cure, um, the right to cure, you know, that, that opportunity for entities to address complaints um, prior to litigation, right? Um, and this allows for um, some of that initial to, um, I would say, alleviate some of the initial compliance concerns. Mm. Um, and that's, and I think that's really important for the business community. Um, and I, I do think, you know, we, we did recommend that it, it be phased out, um, you know, in a, a five-year time frame. The reason for that is because those companies that have to comply with it should have been, you know, through the initial compliance period. Right. So what a cure period serves to alleviate has been accomplished. So yeah. that was the thought process. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting idea, the phased out cure period. Um, and on the uh, and on the sunset and sunrise provisions, um, I think we also, uh, the simplest way to put it is that we got a, uh, how shall I put it, uh, a resulting, a, a resounding hatred uh, <laughs> of those ideas. So uh, yeah. those were tabled. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, well, so, you know, irresponsive. we took... Yes. I mean, we, you know, we took people's input and I think like, I don't think we heard uh, as much distaste for any recommendations as for that particular one. Um, I, so, would, I would say some safe harbor too. I think we got yeah, fair. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> another, another thing that people uh, just don't like. And I think, well, uh, partly I think on the safe harbor piece is that uh, there haven't been a lot of good examples of where safe harbor was structured appropriately to affect what the goal of the policy is. And so, you know, the way in which we envisioned it, or, um, or the way in which, for example, in cybersecurity, uh, this was envisioned by the Cyberspace Solarium Commission for uh, systemically important critical infrastructure entities, SICI entities, um, it, it wasn't structured in a way that, you know, the current some current programs are. So, you know, um, there are like legitimate sort of standards or, or baselines, um, uh, baseline requirements that have to be met in order to then, you know, uh, get some sort of uh, protection. Um, 
but uh, from liability. But I think, you know, if, um, if you, if you can't convince sort of industry that that would to like that they would get that liability protection uh, and nobody wants to give them liability protection doesn't really it doesn't work so yeah understood yeah, I'm, a, I'm, a, the, I'm one of those few voices that is a fan of safe harbors but only because I've, I've worked in the space and understand that when they're crafted well um, they can be a really powerful tool but that's the challenge is getting all that buy-in and getting the right layers and, and level of, of tools um, there to, to make them effective um, we're running close to time uh, so let us uh, start wrapping up. If there are any audience questions, feel free to um, put them in the chat or in the Q&A and we can have a time for one maybe. Um, but uh, yeah, so you all have come up with these amazing papers. I again recommend that everybody read them to see the substance. Um, I'm assuming you're going to try to put them in front of people on the hill to say, here's the path forward. Um, I guess as a, as a closer, though, we can think um, about what we haven't talked about yet, which is just kind of how I, I don't want to ask you, like, if you think privacy legislation will pass since we've had those, I've heard panels end with that question for a decade. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, only and they've that's only because I've only been doing this for that long um, but uh, <laughs> the uh, I guess what factors do you think need to be in place instead for um, for federal legislation to pass what 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 are we uh, are, and and also I guess in that are we in a different position now than we have been before if I could just start by saying that you know we're not so arrogant as to believe that like what we've set out here is going to be the final you know the final answer to any of um, the, you know these these challenging questions that have been floating around for two decades, um, and you know I respect a lot of the work that um, that uh, staff and and members on the Hill, uh, both on the House and the Senate side, uh, have been doing in order to try and find consensus. Um, uh, you know, we just want to be as helpful as we can in order to try and um, present ideas and, and, and find uh, ways to get to that consensus. Um, I, I think that, you know, right now, I think we, um, what can get us there? Like, I, do I think there are factors that are different? I do. I think there's incentives uh, on both sides of the aisles, on both sides of the aisle to try and get this done right now. Uh, I'm an eternal optimist. So, you know, uh, I, I put my check mark in the, hopefully this happens, maybe this happens uh, bucket. But, um, you know, I, I think that Every part, every one of these sort of efforts has moved the ball sort of a little bit further down the line, and I I hope that ours does that as well. Um, and you know, we have engaged with the Hill uh, on this issue, and we will continue to engage. And and um, uh, but you know, I, that's that's my that's my piece. Yeah, uh, and I'll say too, it's like we we have the pieces in place. We have these bills that are so aligned, except on you know some these key issues, right? And here's you know some ideas for moving forward on that, and you know also building off of all the work that other institutions have done, Brookings Institution and IAPP and and you know others that I'm uh, uh, sadly forgetting off the top of my head. But it's like all the pieces are there. And so, you know, and not only that, but the threats are there, right? You asked if we're in a different position. I say yes. Um, looking at China, for instance, I think, um, you know, that whole landscape has shifted a little bit. Um, you know, things with the, the SCOTUS draft ruling, um, the fact that 75% of Americans want this. Um, you know, so I think there are key motivators here and key pieces in place. And so we just need to have that you know, political will just to like push it, I think, across the finish line, um, make this happen. And to follow up on Lauren's, I realize we're running out of time. It's, and that's really the key. We Everybody needs to keep the momentum up here. No matter what group you represent, you're an industry group, you're an advocate, you're a staffer, we need to keep pushing this forward. It's so easy to say, like, it hasn't been done. It's not going to happen now. There's a midterm. We only have so many days left. Like, it, it comes down to like a, a priority and, and just conveying the need. So I think if we keep this out there and we keep pushing the needle forward and we keep having these conversations, um, you know, I remain optimistic, uh, you know, myself. I, um, I share the optimism of my colleagues and I do want to pull the thread a little bit on, you know, something that Lauren brought up 
in the context of like geopolitics and national security. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think, you know, you look at this and you're like, what's different in the moment in which we stand that may, that may actually be, you know, the weight on the scale that finally tips this. And I do think it's that. Um, I think when you start looking at this in the context of, you know, how much not having this at the federal level is hurting us internationally with our diplomatic uh, relationships and in terms of our security. Um, I think that may be um, sort of the, the thing that finally galvanizes the political will. Um, and I think, you know, the fact that most Americans want it um, is something that, you know, is, is not, should not be lost on those that are wanting the votes of most Americans, so. 100% agree. And I mean, I think with China um, stealing a lot of our information and IP uh, with Russia using geolocation data uh, to target uh, missile strikes against uh, Ukrainian uh, forces, um, where some uh, of our allies and, and perhaps some of our uh, advisors are, uh, should give us pause to think exactly how important it is to protect our data uh, and to put in place uh, laws and regulations that will ensure that we are protecting our national security in this way. Is that so? Is this something that we're leaving up to the up to Congress? Um, like, is it is this in their hands now, or is there anything else that that listeners can do uh, to make this happen? Well, call <laughs> your stakeholders. member of Congress, right? <laughs> but uh, but I also think that, um, uh, and this is just me, but you know, um, but I think that in uh, organizations, companies uh, have have really stepped up in the past few years, have put in place privacy protections, um, have have started to take it seriously. Uh, you know, there's browsers that protect and mask and cloak your IP. Um, there's uh, Google has taken steps to uh, to actively uh, do data minimization without being uh, told. But, you know, it can't be some. It has to be all. And so in the end, I think it has to be Congress. Well, on that note and our eternal optimism here, <laughs> we should probably close because we're over time. But thank you again for, for letting me moderate. This has been a great discussion um, and happy anniversary. Thank you. And thank, thank you. you all so much for joining us today. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good one. Okay. Bye.